G'day, everybody. So this is uh, all the answers for the YouTube questions. So if you're seeing this on Facebook, that's where the questions were meant to be. And then next week, it'll be Facebook questions. And um, I'll try and answer them as best I can. So uh, so here we go. There's quite a few I'm on, on YouTube. I've got the questions on here. And I uh, hope the internet's going to be strong enough and all that sort of stuff. Just for, um, just for uh, if you're in Australia watching this, uh, on Monday night on ABC Australian Stories, there's going to be a big story about uh, Jessica and and her life and all the bits of it. But um, you know, I'll put, there's a few things I might pop up in that. And uh, this is a picture of Jessica and I on on the boat. That was Pink Lady uh, before uh, it was painted. That was the day I gave her the you know. Well, go so here's the boat. Let's get started. Um, so anyway, just if you're in Australia, that's something to look forward to. And uh, uh, had another thing over here which i'll forget about for now anyway straight into uh, the question so that's on monday night the uh, oh, i've lost the bloody questions again if i don't keep the screen going it drops off okay first question uh thanks so much just talking about uh this is from jay crampton uh, they're going to miss the ggr when it's uh, all over and uh i agree there's a bit of a wind down imagine what it's like for the entrance they've been living it for eight months but we've all been following it, and there is a big hole when it leaves. But uh, that's it. Enjoying the race immensely. Looking forward to the OGR. Okay, that's the Ocean Grove race in September. Yeah, we're running that fully crewed, Whitbread 50th anniversary, all that sort of stuff. I see you have signed up for the OGR. Yes. Uh, will there be a website following that race? <laughs> okay. And has uh, been for the as has been for the GGR. Yes, there will. It's called OceanGlobeRace.com. So the website's already there, and uh, you're able to follow it. And Captain Coconut's driving our boat, uh, Explorer, which is a Swan 57. And there's quite a few other, or there's quite a few other people associated with the GGR that are actually in the race, and and it's still the same team. You know, Seb will be there, and Georgie's there, and uh, uh, you know, Ada will be doing commentaries and stuff, hopefully <laughs> for OGR. Uh, and uh, yes, yeah, it will. And uh, so it's the same sort of team. You'll see a lot of familiar faces. Jane will still be hiding off camera. She's sitting right there at the moment. Um, and uh, and I'll be there as well, you know, doing doing our bit. We still don't have a big sponsor, but uh, we're starting in Southampton, so that's kind of cool. And um, uh, so, yeah, I don't know how they're all OGR at the moment. Hey, Don, do you think that Kirsten, this is from Nuttick, do you think that Kirsten really doesn't know where she is in the race, or is there gamesmanship going on here, like with the leaders always seeming to be out of the radio comms? Well, that's interesting. I don't think she knows exactly where they are at the moment still. Um uh, so she's probably still in the dark. She's definitely sailing her own race. And, in fact, even Abelish is sailing her own race. It's not close tactics, but it's nice to know where the other entrants are if they can. If they can't, that's just the GGRs, the way it was in 68. I really don't think any entrant is not coming up on the radio because they want to play funny tactics. Uh, that's the last thing they think about. It, it's very, uh, It's a good feeling for them emotionally and psychologically to be talking to other entrants. All the radio comms that aren't happening are due to poor performance of their radio equipment on the boat and that could be due to corrosion of terminals on the radio or like Simon's radio for instance it didn't work very well right from the very beginning we require as the organizer full radio test they've got to get an expert in and test the signal make sure everything's set at the start but sometimes they can deteriorate pretty quickly when they're out in the ocean so um so yeah those with good radios have got a bit of an advantage but I don't think there's any gamesmanship on that uh Rick Will the list of approved boats for the GGR 2026 remain the same? Yes, they will on the, in the notice of race, but we'll take six or seven new boats if anyone wants to enter one. But what we don't do is GGR, as the organiser, doesn't actually approve the designs. We will talk to entrants and say, yeah, that's probably going to be okay. And then once they've entered and there is a new boat coming into the race, then you'll see it on the notice of race. But before that... Um, you won't see them up because there is this funny thing where people want to say, oh, my boat's approved, and then the price, resale value of their boat goes up and they're not even entrants. So um, so there are more boats, um, you know, being discussed by entrants. So that's the part one. Uh, might there be designs valid? Yes, uh, those post in the notice of race. Well, we don't, you know, and in fact, I'm thinking that we probably shouldn't even post them in the notice of race because um, it does funny things. Anyway. Uh, thanks. Great job covering the ordeal. Thanks for that, Rick. Uh, hi, Don. Oop. Um, something happened there. Uh, from Dave. Hi, Don. Question. Read the most dangerous quadrant of a tightly hooked, serious depression, such as the storm uh, that targeted Ian. 
read more. If Ian had been trailing warps and transported to the center of the lobe by the winds and wind waves spiraling clockwise to the center, how could he then break out of the center? Well, that's very true. You know, it's luck of the draw. Um, he was in a bit of a funny shape one at the time on that one. Um, but effectively the safety of the boat and uh, uh, maintaining the present day, the here and now of the waves is more important of getting blown in and blown out. You're either in the safe quadrant uh, and have the chance for the wind spiraling around to sort of throw you out of that uh, loop or you're getting pushed in. But if you're getting pushed in, you've still got to keep the boat safe. So towing the warps is the priority. You can't make a decision to sail out at, at, you know, once you're already affected by that depression. So the key to it is if you have the chance of, to manoeuvre into the safe quadrant, then um, you obviously do that. But in this case, Ian had no chance whatsoever. He was sort of not quite becalmed, but sailing slowly for the days preceding this storm. And uh, and then when the wind finally came, he took off on a, on a starboard tack going in a northeasterly direction, sort of trying to get away from it. And it wasn't going to happen because he can only get a few hours of that before the wind went north. And then he can't go northwest, rather, or he was going northwest, going up. And you would have seen all of a sudden he turned around. We'd advised him to go south. It's the only way he could run with it to get away from the, the core where the extreme winds were. But, of course, he didn't have time. So there was nothing he could do. It was a sitting duck for, for the days leading into it. And then the wind direction from the northwest, you know, then, or from the northeast, and then it went north and then northwest and, and rolled around. He just got blown along. There was nothing he could do. So... Uh, um, but, you know, your tactics there, if you look at uh, Admiralty Manual of Seamanship or any of the things online, how you avoid a cyclone, they always talk about, and you know, live in an area where there's cyclones in Tonga and in Australia, if you're up in Queensland, you always have to be aware of which is a safe quadrant. So if you're making it, if you think there's a cyclone coming towards you, a very tight depression, you work out where the average track is and you can't sail away from it, but you either go to the left or to the right of it. And the decision on going left or right will be determined by you getting into the safe quadrant when it comes over you. And so you'll then get blown out. There's a lot of stuff on YouTube about that as well. So have a look at that. Um, okay, thanks for sharing what you know. Yep, okay, I hope that's a bit of an answer, Dave. Jonathan, hi, Don. It's the 14th of my 67th birthday, and I'm predicting, hopefully suggesting that Kirsten will win because she has the weather and eastern position to now go just south of the Azores and sail a substantially reduced num uh, number of miles in the Bay of Biscay. Well, that's sort of true. Uh, her time allotment will compensate for any weather conditions in the Bay uh, that both she and Abelis will be experiencing together, um, sort of. This, this uh, His boat speed and secret sail won't be enough. Uh, who knows? And not here or not there. To make up for a brilliant navigation, what do you think? Oh, okay. Uh, it could be right, but it's too hard to call at the moment. Absolutely too hard to call. I still have no idea why Abolish is heading out uh, in a northwesterly direction at the moment. I'm watching that. I'm not concerned at the moment, but um, I'll be happy when I see a tweet. And if he continues to do that course, I will question it and maybe send him a message, but um, hopefully it'll change. It could have even... Uh, be changed now. No, there's a, there's a new position coming up in a couple of hours. So we'll wait and see what happens there. I've got no idea what he's doing at the moment. Um, Shane, might Ian have avoided his ordeal if he had tacked north instead of reaching east? Delighted he is safe and sound. Shame about puffing. It was a beauty of a boat and expertly set up for the GTR. No, look, uh, that time when you saw Ian going uh, north or a little bit northwest, as I said before, it was only a few hours, and then it came in from a northerly direction of the wind. So when it was northeast, Ian could have gone northwest or southeast, and he chose northwest, uh, but that, then the wind swung to the north, and it was all over. He had to turn around anyway, so he, he couldn't avoid it. And you can follow that through. You can replay all that stuff. That's the beauty of doing these updates every day. Uh, it's hit great history. You can go back any day, any incident, anything that's happening, and look at what we were saying on the tracker overview. Uh, to replay in your mind what was playing out. Uh, James, I understand the safety issue with leaving Puff and Adrift. Uh, yeah, because it is a navigation hazard. That said, isn't there also an ecological issue with sculling, scuttling her? Yes, but human life takes precedence over the environment. Uh, does Ian's team have a plan for salvage? Uh, not that I know of. They haven't said anything yet. I've had a couple of people talk to me about salvage. 
um but uh it's it's a real challenge i mean it's um uh and i haven't actually done a track on on puffin yet but i'll i might do that when i get a spare moment uh look at the wind and the average wind and weather for that position on the pilot charts and look at the currents and so on and you can actually sometimes predict where it's going to go where the boat's going to drift to uh, in the case of gregor's boat um in the 2018 edition of the race uh, i i was able to predict exactly where it would go over the next two or three months and it exactly took that track because it was in the southern ocean and it's obvious you know it's going to go to the east you know in the southern ocean it'll hook up you know when it starts the, the the westerlies die off and as it hooks up it's going to hook into the trade winds going the other way and that's what exactly what it did it got to within about i think it was about 800 miles of australia and that was when i was suggesting that's the time to make the rush out to go and grab it and bring it back to australia uh but before anyone could do that there was one guy involved but he was a bit funny um they didn't get the chance to do that and then drifted all the way back right across the uh, indian ocean nearly over to reunion and so on and then it finally got lost uh, the tracker went down and so on it was it was a drift for months and months but in this area where puffin is now um i'm not totally familiar with what the potential might be but it might be an interesting exercise it may drift somewhere close to land and i haven't even asked ian whether the hatches are closed things like that um you know if the solar panels are working it'll keep the batteries charged it might keep the electric bilge pump working um and it may keep the tracker going you know the yb3i who knows but uh, that's it at the moment the tracker is on i think 24 hours or 12 hours jane jane uh, jane's nodding her head but <laughs> he changed it but anyway it's supposed to be on 12 or 24 hours one ping um okay so that's that one um and yeah as i say it's, it's traditionally it's the done thing you simply come to the sink drain on the boat you cut a knife through it it takes like 10 seconds you just open the cupboard door just go chunk, cut the sink drain and then just reach in the valve turn the valve on and you have a constant stream of water coming out that little pipe and it takes quite a few hours for it to sink you know it could take six or seven hours you know to fill it up from a half inch pipe or depending on how big the sink pipe is um but ian didn't have a chance to do that so um okay carl uh, good afternoon don why is it mandatory to uh to serve penalties out in the deep rather than deducting the penalties after getting home thanks much love to the ggr because it's a race and this is a a, a well-known principle and uh it's advertised and uh stated in the notice of race when the entrance sign on that that's what will happen you will save save your uh, serve your penalties in the penalty box uh in the north atlantic at a time to be chosen by the organizer and that means that if you've got three or four entrants with time penalties and they all serve them in their penalty box. Uh, once they leave the penalty box, the deal's done. And you can see, you see three boats in the water and you know exactly where the positions are, okay? So there's no adjustment when you get back to the finish line. Uh, and it makes it more exciting because you can see who's really finishing and there's no handicap. I, I don't actually like handicapping because it does confuse people. In the case of uh, when you get a credit, right? In the case of uh, Abolish and Kirsten, who both get credits for helping Tapio, you can't just pick them up off the board and slide them forward. <laughs> you know, they, they can't do a credit in the box. That's a completely different scenario. And then on the issue of the uh, fuel penalty, that's a real topic of discussion. Oh, I've lost the questions. Real topic of discussion. And it creates the the interest in the environment and uh, and creates some interesting challenges for entrants as well. So that is added at the end, and it'll be the provisional finishing time will be affected by most of the entrants normally if they weren't involved with the rescue uh, at the time they come to the press conference once they hit the wharf, uh, and then we announce the the actual finishing time. And so the reason we go through all that, you know, just to expand it on that a little bit more, is that why do we have a, a fuel penalty at all? Uh, why not let them have electric motors and stuff? Well, then if you had solar panels and electric motors, you'd see some entrant come in with, you know, 5,000 watts of solar panels on their boat, an electric engine, and they could motor with their engine all the way around the world because it's perpetual motion, you know, um, you know, through the battery. So we can't allow that. We're not interested in advancing technology because electric motors and solar are really good, blah, blah, blah. Um, but they need fuel on the boat for emergency situations, which is what we've always said. And as you saw with Kirsten, when she bolted to get to Tapio, she had the fuel to use to get there with her engine, right? Uh, and if she, if we didn't have that fuel, electric engines can't do that. You know, electric engines can't store enough energy to go long time fast. Uh, you know, the batteries will go flat and then you, you cook, you know, you've got to sail. So uh, it's important for, um, 
for safety to make sure they have fuel on board to use in emergencies and it, and also to charge their batteries in emergency if they need it. And if they use more fuel than, than they should, uh, then they, they face the, the penalty, you know, so it's a balance. And so entrants are using wind generators and water generators and solar panels as much as they can to stop using fuel. Anyway, I digressed on that one. Fred, for entrants with a time penalty, why not simply add it to those sort of same question? Time bucks would like to be similar to entrance time credits. No, you can't put a time credit. You can't serve a time credit in a box. Um, and normally there wouldn't be time credits. This is just to clear the decks. Uh, Nicholas, hi, Don. Is there a standard protocol for uh, maritime rescue coordination centres to contact vessels at sea? Some appear to respond very quickly, while with others it can seem to take considerable time. Yes, there is a standard process. It comes down to uh, uh, GMDSS requirements and uh, also SOLAS agreements. The rescue coordination centres around the world, the whole world is chopped up into zones of responsibility. So in the case of Australia, Australia has a huge area around Australia that, that the uh, rescue coordination centre and AMSA are responsible for. So if a ship sets off an EPIRB in that area, uh, they've got to try and instigate the rescue. And uh, so as part of that, any ships transiting the zone are requested uh, as their normal daily thing to give a daily report. It's usually an automatically transmitted report giving the position, course, speed of the vessel sent direct to the Rescue Coordination Centre and it's all plotted. So they have all this information uh, coming up on their data bank and if nothing's happening, nothing happens. They just stale through their area and they keep going. But if there's ever a rescue or, or some drama on the go and they need to contact the ship, they've got all the details and data on that ship and GMDSS has a primary form of uh, communication links, uh, satellite communications. So the MRCCs can contact that ship by satellite you know, texting or emailing and uh, they have to have this on the bridge of the ship and they usually have to have two complete systems. So if one fails for any reason, the message will get through on the other one. And if the electrical systems fail, they have to have emergency batteries on board. These are on board big ships. Um, and so there's always a way to communicate. Okay, very important for safety. So a, a yacht gets into trouble, they send a message to the ship and they ask the ship if, they t if, if, uh, if it's possible for them to make uh, safe speed, maximum safe speed to the scene of a, an incident and provide assistance. And then it's up to the, ma the, cap the master of the vessel to decide whether he wants to do that or not. And effectively under maritime law, it is, it's, it's, uh, you have to respond, okay? You have to go and assist someone uh, in distress. It's law, it's the law of the sea. It goes back hundreds of years when people weren't obliged to do it. And they However, if the master of the vessel senses or thinks that it's not safe for him to do so and he's worried about the safety of his vessel or the people on board, he doesn't have to go. And so he'll make an objective decision and sensibly uh, that you, you virtually never hear of a report of anyone not providing assistance because they need to be in port because they've got to go to an important dinner or they've got to get their cargo off. It, it's part of what happens. And so the things in this case with Ian, there were a couple of ships that were tasked to do or requested to do the job. They looked at the weather and said, this is unsafe for us to do that. And I fully appreciate that. Uh, you get any big ship, if you're smashing into waves, it can have all sorts of impacts. So I'm not sure the communications, but often there is then a risk assessment by the master of the vessel. And I've been involved with all this situation from each end of the spectrum. You know, uh, I've been on ships when we've been requested to go and, uh, provide assistance and there's a risk assessment you know you sort of say oh look it's not really good for us but uh, I wonder if there's anyone else that can go you know to do something and so then the rescue coordination communicates well we're trying to get these other fishing boats but we're not sure anyway in the meantime can you start heading that way and if you're on task we'll keep trying to get these closer boats and uh, if we can't then you'll maybe be the only one and and so then all of a sudden it pops up and they get a couple of boats that are closer then you'll be relieved of your task. They say, no, we don't need you anymore. So that ship might have been steaming for four or five hours to and then they get they get released, you know. And so uh, so anyway, but yeah, to simply answer the question, I got a bit sidetracked there. Uh, yes, there is a system where uh, all the ships there can be contacted by the MRCCs. Uh, and uh, once the message is done, uh, it's up to the master of the vessel to, to go. Some of the some of the fishing boats are hard to contact. That's why they went through the embassy. 
uh, the, the Taiwanese embassy. Uh, the embassy can usually get them, even if they can't, because the different vessels have got different reporting things. So, uh, but in the Ian's case, it worked really well, and the Taiwanese were fantastic. Uh, the government was really positive, and uh, embassy was good. Um, okay, uh, from Sean. Thanks for the great daily coverage. Absolutely super. Question, in your prediction, Don, are you looking at first home with time allowance factors in or just first home across the line? Now, I'm just talking about first home uh, with Abolish and Kirsten uh, on the basis of the course and the weather. I don't even, you know, no use trying to predict. Even when I'm doing that, I'm only predicting it within a few days. It's like a trend. I'm not saying that, oh, now, you know, two weeks from the finish, oh, Abolish is going to arrive one day ahead of Kirsten or Curse is going to arrive one day ahead of Abolish. I'm just giving a trend for that day saying, oh, Curse is in the lead or Abolish is in the lead. It's, it's there and then based on the weather and the projection forward, but I don't ever put the um, time compensation in. That will come later. Trevor, hi, Don and team. Question, how would you rate the 1976 Dreadnought 32 catch for the GGR? It's uh, This is a double-ender. It's like a, a, a fiberglass production version of William Atkins' original, was it Atkins? Uh, Tahiti catch. Very heavy boat, like a like a uh, it's like a uh, West Sail Thirty Two, maybe a little bit heavier. Even it's got a more of a bluff bow, like a traditional um, what do you call them? Uh, a traditional, not a lugger, but yeah, different shape than a than a West Sail. West Sail Thirty Two would be faster than a Dreadnought Thirty Two, I reckon. Um, so pretty heavy boat, very safe. Nothing wrong with it for the GGR. Beside the standard rig with jib, staysail. Main and mizzen, what sails do you think are best to carry? Anything that makes you go fast. On a catch rig, you don't need Abolish's secret sail. Uh, that's um, that's not relevant to a catch rig. I'm trying to get more here. Okay, question three. What are the pros and cons of a catch along the GGR track? Catch is really cool. If you get the right sort of catch, you can put mizzen staysails up. Um, you've got the ability to balance the boat. You know, if you lose your wind vane, uh, balancing the boat, the pressure on the forward and aft can twist it around, makes it easy to steer. And I think that was one of the successes of uh, Robin Ops Johnson and Sue Haley. When he lost his self-steering gear, he had a catch and he could balance the boat a lot easier than a sort of modern cut or a sloop because the, the, the main mast of a catch is a long way further forward and so you get rid of the mizzen and it's still pulling from forward. Um, and so also when you got a beam wind, the beam wind on the beam, it's very easy to balance the boat because you put the mizzen up and sheet that in hard but ease off on your head sails or main or something and you can put more pressure on the front or the back of the boat to send it in a different direction so there's some there's some good advantages for a catch they look good too nuri is one of the prettiest looking boats in the fleet i reckon you know uh Gug must be quite proud of well i know he is it looks good and their sponsors uh, must like it as well it makes great photos and uh, uh i've got a catch too did i tell you it's 157 catch <laughs> uh anyway it's all fun uh uh, okay, question from Facebook that James dropped in here. I don't know what I'm going to do without GGR daily updates, so I'm so invested. That's not a question, that's a statement. That was from someone. Uh, Leslie, I'm interested in the in use of drogue versus sea anchor. Sea anchor keeps bow to the weather, uh, the part of the boat built to take it. Most of the research into sea anchors published refers to large parachutes deployed in less than 50 knots of wind. Having used much smaller versions, about a metre diameter on a 36-foot steel hull, in both Atlantic and Pacific in 50 to 60 knots, it was relatively comfortable, no risk of fouling the stern gear. Didn't observe the parachute catching up. Where's the question? Only problems were potential for chafe. Uh, okay, slow drift. So were we lucky? Uh, or are these specific circumstances where a drogue might be... Well, look, okay, uh, I can't think of many situations in the Southern Ocean in big seas and storms where a parachute anchor would be viable, okay? Uh, you're always going to be crashing backwards, you know, and uh, you'd have to be, you know, you know, you get 20-metre seas or 15-metre seas uh, that are breaking cross seas, this, that, and the other. Uh, it's not really there. The only reason I would ever consider, this is my personal opinion now, and I'm not an expert, okay, the only reason I'd ever use a, a sea anchor off the bow of the boat, not a drogue off the bow of the boat, because you've got a little one on a big boat. It's just acting as a drag on the bow, and the boat will do three, three point turns, in my opinion, uh, is if you're caught on a lee shore and you can't run before the wind and waves, uh, then you've got to stop the boat. You either heave to 
or you might consider a parachute anchor. Uh, you know, I've never used either in earnest. The closest I had was uh, we had a parachute anchor on my bounty boat, 25 foot whale boat. We did 4,000 miles across the Pacific with nothing. We had that in case we got hooked up with an early cyclone, and in a little boat with an early with a, with extreme weathers, a parachute anchor is the only way to go. You know, a little boat downwind doesn't work. So, uh, I'm not a you know they have their place. We had one on our ship. I had a 36 metre ship, and I had a 120 foot diameter parachute anchor with a with a the the, the rope on it was like that. It was huge, and uh, it was in case we lost our main engine on the ship. It's 36 metres, 600 ton. Uh, and we had a parachute anchor because with a ship in the Southern Ocean, if you lose your engine, you wallow, you go sideways and you get a, a, a synchronous roll. So you, the ship does little rolls and then all of a sudden it starts to get in time with the waves, go whoop, 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 and then next minute, bang, you're on your side and the ship's cooked, you know, everyone on board's gone. So we had a massive uh, parachute anchor. So they do have their place. But in the Southern Ocean with this sort of racing, my personal opinion is a drogue is for extreme conditions if things aren't working right, but I prefer to run before it with warps. And a, the difference between warps and a drogue is simply that with a drogue, you stick it out, you've got massive drag, and you've got single line. With warps, you can do a big bite and you can easily pull half of it in. It makes it going into like a gear ratio. When you're pulling it in, you only got half the load because you're just pulling in one side. And, um, and so that's my preference. But... Uh, to use a no, I don't think anyone on board with the GGR has got a got a parachute anchor uh, for that purpose. But anyway, there is a place for it. Lots of reading and advice on online. I'm taking too long, too long for these answers. Uh, hi Don, I understand that Nuri has a four hour penalty for entering the zone. Why not simply adjust it? I think I've answered all that. Uh, fuel adjustment and so on. It's good to get it clear. You know, you've got three entrances. They do the box and it's done, and then they you know where they are as they're approaching the finish line. I. Don, my question is whether Ian considered sailing Puffin with a jury rig sail over to Cape Town following the currents, and if so, why he decided to abandon. You'll have to ask Ian that. It's a very interesting question. Uh, remembering, there's a very important point here. Ian turned his e on well before he lost his mast, okay? Ian was very concerned about the weather. He wasn't injured. Uh, he was just it was pretty rugged, you know, and I don't know how long, hard it was blowing, but the forecasting was saying that it was blowing, um, uh, you know, had the potential to gust from, uh, you know, 80 to 95 knots or even more. And he was absolutely in the extreme end of it. And uh, he simply couldn't tell anyone who was in the poo. Uh, the boat was fine. Everything was fine. But what happened was he couldn't control the boat. And part of the reason he couldn't control the boat, we, we spoke many hours before, uh, when he was blowing 25 knots in about th uh, two, three metres or three metres sea or something. And we had a good chat on the phone. Uh, he was going to drop the main because I warned him. I said, look, when this weather hits, it's like a wall. It's just going to come in and go bang. So I said, get the drogue ready and this, that and the other, you know, because you're going to drop the main. And uh, his words to me were basically that he was concerned about putting the drogue out because last time it got hooked up in the, in the hydro vein and broke the rudder. Um, remembering that, uh, and I told him that this because I said, they remember you got so slow. He's doing one and a half knots with the drogue out. You don't do that. Once the boat starts to slow down, you have to get the drogue inboard straight away. Otherwise, if you've got a wind vane on the back and it doesn't matter whether it's a, any, a, a, a servo pendulum system like an Aries or a wind pilot or anything or whether it's a hydro vane, that rope and the movement of the boat, because first of all, you've got the line, the, boat, the line stretching. So there's a slingshot effect. And when the... When the line pulls the, the boat, it can stop the relative motion and then the line goes slack as well because the next wave's coming and the boat's backed up a bit. And, and so the line flops around. If you're doing one and a half knot average speed, you do not have a drogue out the back. It means the drogue's done its purpose, right? You should be doing, even with a drogue out, you should still be doing three knots, three or four knots even, and the drogue's working. And so... It's pulling the back of the boat back. But if you've got a drogue out and it's only blowing 30 knots or something and you're doing one and a half knots, you are going to absolutely hook up with anything and everything on the back of the boat. So anyway, he decided he didn't want to put the drogue out at that point. When we made the first phone contact, Ian's words were along the lines of, Don, I'm in trouble. Uh, I can't hold the boat to uh, stern to the waves. Uh, we discussed what was happening. He had nothing up, running bare poles. In those situations, you can only hand steer. 
Uh, he didn't want to get the drogue out because the cockpit was filling with water often and the, the locker where it goes into uh, was vertical and it would just flood into the compartment, but the compartment was supposed to be sealed under the rules of the race. Uh, but he couldn't get, he said he couldn't get the drogue out. Um, and uh, it was too dangerous to be hand steering. He said he was nearly washed out of the cockpit two times. Uh, so uh, he decided it was too all too hard. Uh, and he'd already had the EPIRB on then for some time uh, prior to that. And then it was many hours later, um, I forget the exact timing, I've got it in our crisis management log, uh, and I've got recordings of all the phone calls as well, I could go back and listen to it. But I, it, I think it was probably two or three hours later, uh, Ian must have been down below because he got thrown. Uh, so no one was steering, no drogue out, and he was sort of rolled. And uh, his words, the mast was... Um, uh, collapsed like a matchstick. Um, and so the boat would have been laid a, laying a hull uh, in the waves, side onto the seas and swell, and then that's what happened. It was pretty extreme. So uh, so in, in those situations then, um, I didn't realise until we saw the photo that the mast broke at the spreaders, so he had the base of the mast there. So it means the lowers were still supporting that first section of the mast. And uh, for whatever reason, Ian decided that uh, it, it wasn't uh, a case of him wanting to do a, a jury rig sale, even though all the entrants have to train for that. And uh, he accepted the lift with the uh, with the ship. And so Puffin's now adrift. So um, there'll be a full wrap up on this and you'll hear Ian's uh, story when he's there and he can answer uh, the questions and so on. He was injured. You can see there's a photo I saw today, a couple of dings on his head. And um, he's obviously very bruised, but I think the back is all a muscle thing, right? There's no bone issue there uh, from what I can see. Um, okay, uh, from JS, why is it such a huge process to get another sailboat design approved in the GGR? It's not a huge process. Uh, all I do, as soon as someone gives me a design, I go, name the design, sailboat data, boom, press the button. I look at the uh, displacement length, this, that, and the other. Then... Uh, that's the first part. If they meet all those, it's all set. Okay. We don't uh, want centre cockpit boats. We don't want pilot house boats. We don't consider the the Endurance 35 to be a true pilot house boat. So we accept that. Uh, we don't like shallow draft boats. And uh, that's really about it. I think they're the main ones. Yeah, we don't, we don't want uh, a centre cockpit. We don't want pilot house. We don't want uh, shoal draft. Uh, we don't want, certainly don't want motor sailors, you know. So uh, it's, it's very simple, very simple indeed. Uh, but they've got to meet the parameters. Um, so, so with this five design parameters, uh, please talk a bit about what else goes into it. Yeah, that's it. Simple as that. So I usually answer anyone who, if they've got an entrant entering the race, and uh, we're discussing it, I can answer them within minutes. You know, it's not a problem. Uh, it's not a huge problem at all. Uh, from Facebook, uh, Leslie, I'm interested in the use of drogue versus sea anchor. Oh, we went through that. Sea anchor keep, I think she probably came in and put the question up again. Um, uh, yeah, has done so. We've got that. Uh, smiley ant, cool. How reliable is Sheik to tiller steering? Uh, very reliable if the conditions allow it, okay. And the boat sort of is okay to do that. Well, when I say very reliable, you still get. You can still get hit by wave. You can have the boat perfectly set up with sheet tiller steering and the sails balanced and the way she goes. And then it's very easy in flat water when there's just average waves. As soon as you get a big wave, if a wave slaps into the back quarters of the boat, it'll push the boat around and get it out of balance for a bit and it might not come back too quick. Uh, same the other wave, it hits the bow. But Arnaud had some good experiences. He went and did 1,600, mile, 1600 miles without a wind vane specifically to play around with the idea of sheet to tiller, and it was quite successful. Captain Coconut, when he did the uh, prologue from uh, uh, Gijon to La Sable de Lone, he had his wind vane under service, and he still sailed by himself, and he just used sheet to tiller all the way. He was quite impressed with what he did. He said, hey, I did it, and it was pretty cool. So he thinks it's okay. But every boat has a different uh, level of acceptability to do sheet to tiller, you might say, and, it, and there's various ways to set it up as well. So it's not quite so simple but it works uh and so it works well i'm wondering why it is not used when wind vane hydro like hydro vane fails instead the sailors have to bail out of the race to port well the other thing is sheet tiller in the southern ocean in the big gale not such a good idea 
uh, and sailing around the world's a long, long way. So sheep to tiller for all that distance is a bit too much, maybe, because there's too many risks involved. Um, it's all about risk mitigation and the entrants are all sensible on that. Um, but if you are caught short in the middle of the ocean, you're 500 miles from home or 1,000 miles from home, if you can set it up, go for it. But it, So it's not the answer. Go to Google. There's a lot of information, a lot of videos on YouTube about people setting up sheep to tiller, the different ways you can do it. It's quite interesting to see. And if you've got a boat, give it a try. It might be fun. Uh, hi, Don. Would it be possible to share your views about different types of rigs looking for the, from the safety perspective this time and not the sail plan? I'm personally interested in the understanding of what you see best for around the world voyage. Uh, the masthead versus fractional. Okay, first of all, this is a very complicated uh, story. I could sit here for hours and talk about this lot. Um, and there's no, you know, e everything, even with the boat, the hulls, each hull has got advantages and disadvantages. You know, they do different things. And the rigs, they've all got different advantages and, and so on. But for around the world in the GGR, I'll answer specifically the questions. Number one, masthead uh, versus fractional. I would absolutely go masthead usually because, you can really strap it down. You've got your forestay and backstay going to the masthead. You can have a set of runners on your on your inner forestay, your staysail uh, coming back. You strap your runners down. If you then in storms, you can reef your mainsail to the point where it clears underneath the runners, which are supporting the inner forestay for the storm jibs and staysails and stuff. So then you've got forestay, backstay, Inner force day, two runners all strapped down, and you're still able to tack the main back and forwards. That's re heavily reefed, and you've got your staysail. That's really solid, and uh, helps support the mast. Um, the next one, single spreader with a diamond strut jumper where the cutter stay is attached to the mast. Now, forget the diamond strut thing. You know, that's a waste of time. Just go for runners. Um, and single spreader is coming back into vogue now. I discussed this with Simon Kerwin's boat, and a boat that I had designed. A, nearly two years ago now for another voyage. Um, the designer says, oh, we presented me single spread. I said, huh? But it's the it's the new thinking, and that's exactly what Simon's got for racing because you're saving weight aloft, and that's what Simon's got. That's why he's only running one halyard at a time sometimes. He doesn't have spare halyards there. He leaves the mouse to save weight aloft, and so that increased the riding moment of the boat. So, um, uh, so uh, single spreaders... Uh, Single spreaders is uh, yes and no. Uh, cheapest, sorry, I'm, get, I'm hooked up here. The bloody phone keeps switching off when I'm not touching it. Um, so single spreader, twin spreaders, the thing that always amazes me, and like, for instance, uh, Ian's boat was dismasted. The bottom half was still sitting there. That's cool. Ian's rig was a Seldon rig. It was super duper strong. You know, like to the point of being overstrong, brand new with all the gear, all the best thinking, and Seldon always do. You know, on special boats, they'll do a full computer analysis of it. It was way over, but he lost it, and that's what happened in 2018 as well. We had we had five rigs, I think, that went down, and yet these were the best in the industry that had designed these rigs. You know, um, so sometimes I'm a bit of a loss on that one. Uh, what's going on. But anyway, inline spreaders or swept back spreaders. For the GGR, I would never have swept back spreaders because there's too much downwind work. And with swept back spreaders, you know, you're backing off the main, you can't go far enough forward because it's fouling the, 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 uh, the cap shrouds because they're coming down. And then because you can't do that, when you get big puffs, it wants to, on the main, it wants to round the boat up. So, and it's hard to reef, you know, you can, the only way to reef downwind is to have your, your main gone right off at flat, it's flat against your cap shrouds because the boom's right out, and then you can walk it down. You know, you just pull, you just winch in on your luff line to drag the luff down, and then when you've got your luff trapped in and jammed off, you just uh, tighten up on your leech line, and it just pulls the boom up to the reef point, and it's done, and then you can crank it in a bit if you need to. So uh, you can actually reef downwind in 40, 50 knots. It's really good. So I would never have swept back spreaders in the, um, in the GGR. Uh, the thing about that, if you pick a design – for the GGR, if it if whatever the, the chain plate positions are, you have to use those chain plates. So you can put two spreaders in if it was originally designed with a single spreader, but you can't move the chain plate. So you can't go from inline spreaders going to swept back spreaders. Okay, and the same if it's designed as a masthead boat, you can't change it to a fractional rig boat because it's part of the design concept. You know, you can't do it. 
Um, next one, continuous or discontinuous shrouds, does it matter? It can matter. And in fact, you know, I thought about this when I was doing it. Uh, guy uh, I knew and spent a bit of time with, John Sanders, did three solo circumnavigations without stopping, okay? He basically, on a 40-footer, on a 42-footer or something, um, so John was really quick, and I never forget when I saw it, he did two of everything. He had two sets of standard rigging on the mast, all duplicated, right? But before that, on other trips, when it came to doing the uh, catch routes, for instance, on a two-spreader rig, you can go from the masthead through the first spreaders and go all the way down to the deck with one set. Then you can do another set, which has the inter going to the second spreader and then all the way down to the deck. So then if you wires break, you might lose the top of the mast, but you will hold it at the second spreaders because it's completely discontinuous and you've got the whole second set coming down, you know. And I think uh, that's probably, if I was doing a twin spreader rig, that might be the way I go. I don't know. Uh, it's uh, interesting points, but um, if you've got the right size of discontinuous rigging, it should be fine. On the Swan 57, my new boat, it's got discontinuous rigging, but the sizes are massive and the engineering is simple and strong. So and it'll all be renewed. So I've got faith in it for around the world. Um, okay. Uh, one set of lowers versus... After the forward laws, uh, it's like a baby stay. Uh, I don't mind, you know, you, you make a concept. If you're going to go inline spreaders and lots of stuff, you might as well have four and a half lowers, forget the baby stay. And and so that, that goes part of it. Uh, having the mast as short as possible uh, versus as long as possible. This is, this is John Lucas caused problems, right? Because people were aware that John Luke uh, lowered his mast about a metre and a half compared to a normal rustler. Okay, and so everyone said, "Oh, I'm going to drop my mask. You know, going to do this and make it shorter. It's going to be safer because it's shorter because John Luke survived the DGR and all that stuff." That's not the case at all. You got to understand John Luke's mentality. It took him three months of sail testing to come to the conclusion that he could afford to lose the top one and a half meters of his mast. It wasn't just a case of saying, "Ah, oh, a shorter mast is safer." What he did is he he actually drew up polars of the boat. And, you know, went out and went sailing and he looked at the boat in all sorts of sailing conditions, you know, uh, for this wind strength, that course, all that sort of stuff. And he found he was re reefing the boat really early. So what he did is he said, oh, bugger that. Okay, I don't need to be that high. I can take a lot of weight out of the top of the mast uh, and forget about, you know, in, when it's really slow, I might be a little bit, but I've got all this advantage for riding moment because pulling the weights down lower means the boat's more powerful, it'll stand up for longer. And so it was a full analysis. It wasn't just, and the classic was Guy Debord <laughs> in the early days. Guy said, oh, I'm going to take some weight out of the mast, you know, blah, blah, blah. And then he came up with a great, the brilliant idea. So, no, I'm going to, going to decrease my sail area differently. I'm going to chop the bowsprit off and uh, do this, that, and the other. Because people just weren't getting it. They just thought John Luke was just saying, oh, I'm going to save up there. Boom. He did it based on the performance of the boat. So you need to look at the original design and why change it if it's there. You don't have to worry about that. Save weight aloft, of course, but it's not just a case of following what Jean-Luc did because he did it for a very specific reason. Uh, sail balance. Look, the designers, the original designers of the boats have got it right. They know how to balance the boat. I don't know. I used to, you know, I can design sail rigs and it's all centre of efforts on the sails and centre of ladder resistance. It's got to be in a set way, blah, blah, blah. The designer's got it right. Don't play with it. You know, look at sail shape, buy better shaped sails, get someone to do a real analysis because a lot of these boats are considered to be performance cruisers. If you get your sail maker to get the computer models out and look at the polars and all that stuff, they could then design your sails as racing sails. So I often talk about Simon, for instance, saying, wow, his sails are slick. And Jeremy's got some really nice sails as well. And I can guarantee you they're not just luff leach foot measurement sails and go, boom, press it out and make a sail. They've done a full, the sailmaker would have looked at the type of boat and this, that, and the other, and decide what the shape is, the curve, the, where's the draft, all this sort of stuff, and really work on the, the sail shape and come up with a good shape. So uh, there's a lot in it. Anyway, would any of these distant ranges help keep the mast up in case of roll over? I don't know. Uh, I couldn't answer that. Also, in general, is there any I ideal type of rigging in the Southern Ocean? Yeah, rigging that keeps the mast up. I, that's as I say, I'm confused on some issues. Um, so uh, Ian had three reefing gears. Someone said that could have put a lot of load on in a rollover stuff, and that's true too. But uh, geez, the mast was strong. 
that one took a while. Sorry, uh, Warren, a uh, warp question from Warren If the competitors got within VHF of one of the many yachts crossing the Atlantic at the same time, could they get a proper forecast from them and not just the current weather that Kirsten has? Uh, yeah, any they can talk to any ship at sea and get all, anything they want from those because that, that's the tradition of the sea. There's no restrictions on what sort of weather you can get from ships. They could get on Windy and have a look on their internet on the ship and start reporting to the entrant and go for it. Uh, they can even uh, give them routing if the if the captain of that ship says, "Oh, if you head northeast for the next two days, you're going to get the best southwesterly." That's weather routing, and that would be allowed from a ship at sea, an, an unassociated ship at sea, not one that's manned by his all his crew, by the team of the of the entrant. Um, uh, from PH, any news on the diesel leak on Bain? Oh, yeah, that was a funny one. Uh, Katie Strickland from uh, Practical Boat Owner now, who used to be with Yachting Monthly. Uh, she's been doing great interviews with the entrance, and she, I forgot to ask the question, and she listens to me and stuff, and she's oh, probably said, oh, don't forgot to ask about the fuel. So she asked Abolish, and he answered for the article, and what it was, and I got the news from Seb and Lutz, Nathan, said there was a fuel leak and blah, blah, blah. And then when I quizzed him on it, when everyone was asking, I said, oh, geez, I don't know. You know, was there a fuel leak? So this is what happened. He had some issues at the back of the boat when the wind generator broke and put a hole in the breather pipe, which meant that some fuel was leaking out of the fuel tank breather in rough conditions, and that went into the bilge. And so there was a diesel slick in the bilge water, and Abolish thought, oh, my lost half a gallon of water a half a gallon of fuel or gallons of fuel and so he got it all out and in the end um uh he th now thinks it may have been a liter or so you know one or one and a half liters or something so it's not what was perceived and some of those comments are saying oh look if he's lost 100 liters jeepers that's 200 hours you know it's none of that none of that so it looks like it's um uh looks like it's only um uh, only in litres. There was another interesting one. I think it was speaking to, because I was asking the entrance in the sound clouds, uh, who was it with? It was with Goog. Uh, Goog's got seawater in his fuel tank. <laughs> so he's he's worried about running the running the uh, engine. Now, fortunately, because that begs the question, if he half filled the tank with seawater, then when we put the fuel back in the tank, um, when we put the fuel back in the tank, uh, it might only take 20 litres because there's all this seawater under the fuel and you can't run the engine. Well, Goog's not running his engine. He's made some, taken some clean fuel. He's not running it from the main tank. Put it in a jerry can and he's got a, made a hot-wired fuel line into the engine so he can run it a bit just to keep it going. But he's really worried about running it because of this salt water in the fuel. Fortunately, Goog is 10 days behind the leader. So uh, I don't think it's going to be an issue in, in terms of the way we handle the fuel consumption penalty. Okay, but that's an interesting issue, that one. Um, okay, uh, can you tell me back to the herring. Okay, Mark Wilson, do you know if the weather facts machines on both boats are still working? I'm assuming you're referring to Kirsten and Abolish. Abolish never fitted a weather facts. He didn't have time or he didn't have the money or didn't think it was worth it. So Abolish has not got a weather facts on board. Or does one boat have better info than the other? Absolutely. Kirsten's getting weather maps now. And it may be why she turned and she's running along the edge of the wind gradient there. Because this morning when I looked, I was like, don't turn too early. Um, but but she's holding it. She's running right on the edge. And she clearly said in the, in the SoundCloud conversation I had last week that uh, she's getting maps now. Um, she's just outside the zone for the forecast for the map. And she thinks it'll get better as she gets closer. And she's got closer. And so the maps are getting better. And she made a distinct turn on the course. Uh, so I've got a feeling she's got a weather map. And that could give her a big advantage, a huge advantage going forward against Abolish unless he can get some forecasting. Um, and that's all got to do with planning, preparation and execution, my three favourite words. So um, uh, that's what it is. So, uh, okay, uh, Nicola. Uh, Though not in the race, how many chances or percentage Simon will arrive before the other two? Oh, okay. Uh, I reckon there's a 85% probability. If all the, if all three boats have no major dramas, touch wood, uh, there's an 85% probability, I reckon, that, that Simon will arrive first. He'll, uh, he'll get home clear of the others for sure. Uh, but how far ahead? Who knows? He's sailing particularly well, and, and uh, Howden's is a very hot boat, you know. And I get excited about that in my own way because, you know, I've always part of the concept of the GGR is to highlight the issue about boats. 
And Simon is the first one that's made people realize that it's more than just the boats. The reason we, you know, we chose the different boats, you know, between 32 to 36 feet and this style, partly because it's held heralds back to 68, but the other part is the hulls are so strong. If, if they're being in real strife in the Southern Ocean, uh, you um, you shouldn't have to abandon the boat into a life raft. You know, that's our, that was one of my major concerns. You know, the, the perfect life raft capsule, the boat could be completely trashed, but you will be cocooned in the boat for, uh, for until someone can get to you and help. Uh, anyway, the other thing is that it gives everyone a chance of winning. And so now you've got a Biscay 36 that's eating the pants off the Rustler 36s. Huh, Rustler 36, old hat, get yourself a Biscay 36, do it right, and it's a hot boat. Put good sails on it, it's a hot boat. Be a good sailor, it's a hot boat. Try and save weight, it's not such a hot boat if you don't take a spare hydrovane. <laughs> so it's the way the race goes. It's planning, preparation, execution. So I'm quite excited about um, Simon sailing so well because it shows that, um, you know, it's more than just the design of the boat. Hi, do fiberglass hulls deteriorate? Lose strength over time. Is a 40-year-old boat weaker because of age than a newer, similar boat? Uh, I'd summarise that by saying no. They can actually get harder uh, as they get older. Uh, if a boat's had maintenance issues and there's moisture in the laminations and things like that, it can get weaker, a lot weaker. But that's all catered for by the surveys that have to be done on the boat and uh, none of the entrants are going to pick a soft boat. So, uh, And then they have to do a final survey and the surveyor uh, goes over everything. They put moisture meters on the hull and... You know, they do everything and then they come to the conclusion that the boat is safe to go to sea. So uh, nothing wrong with 40, 50 year old boats. My new boat was built in 1978 and she's as solid as a rock. Ooh, that's Explorer. So I have no problems whatsoever. Uh, and and most, you know, all of the GGR designs have been approved. They were built in the era where they were like this thick, you know, really strong. Uh, hey, Don, is there a reason why none of the GGR boats attach their drogue and the front of the boat uh, with the boat facing the waves, that way it can't interfere with the wind vanes. Yeah, but you're going backwards. I mean, it is, a, you know, facing the waves is always good, but droves won't stop the boat from going backwards, okay? So you could particularly, you practically do a backflip if you're stopping the boat, you know, but uh, a drogue is only meant to put a force on the, on the line to slow it down. So I can't imagine going backwards at four knots or three knots through the Southern Ocean with the drogue at the front. So it's the, you're mixing the principles of a sea anchor and a drogue. And a sea anchor anchors the boat to the sea, and it's got to be a huge parachute anchor or something like that. And uh, some people might consider it, but I would never do it in the Southern Ocean. Uh, John, hi, Don. How many people are signed up so far in 2026 GGR? Do you have a maximum number of entrants? Yes, we have a maximum number. It's only 26. Uh, we don't talk about the number of entrants until after the, this GGR is finished. But we've got seven rustlers. They signed, they've been signed up for months. Uh, and we've got a huge interest. And... Uh, It'll be interesting to see how many we, we declare, but uh, I, I've got no doubt that we will uh, eventually get to the 20, to the 26 entrance. And then once that happens, uh, we've got uh, four special invitations that we could do and we'll create a wait list. In 2018, we had 15 on the wait list uh, with, with 30 boats signed up. Uh, Captain Coconut was number 15 on the wait list, but he still made the start. So there's a lot of up and down uh, on, on this, but yeah, we've got, we're not short of entrance, so but we only talk about that officially uh, after in July. J July sometime, we'll uh, put all the entrance up on the website. Uh, Cameron, question. In the notice of race, you specify the pilot house, centre board, shoal draft and centre cockpit boats are not normally approved. I understand the centre board and shoal draft issues. Well, you know, I was going to race in the, GG, in the BOC in 1986 in a centre board boat, 50 footer with four six draft, four foot six draft with a non ballasted centre board that went down through the middle. It was an Adams Radford design um, and uh, only had a point of balancing stability of 11 degrees, I think it was. So come to 11 degrees and then it was 11 or it was really low and it rolled over. But if it rolled over to come up again very quickly because it was a narrow boat, it was only 12 foot beam on 50 feet. So therefore, you don't have a big riding arm, you know, and so it'll recover really easy. So it's not just the centre board and, and shoal draft, but but there are issues. So generally, we don't because generally big heavy boats, uh, shoal draft, they're bordering on being motor sailor and uh, all that sort of stuff. So uh, so that's part of it. Uh, and centre cockpit boats are not normally approved. I understand the centre board issues and draft issues. Can you explain the issue of pilot house or the site or centre cockpit? Uh, quite easy. 
pilot house boats usually have big side panels. And if you get dropped, uh, you know, 10 metres or more from a wave that just picks up the boat, and this is where the boat has nothing to do with it. It's like having a bucket of water. If you have a bucket of water and you put a little toy boat in it that big, if you get that whole bucket of water and just go, that little boat's gone. And that can happen in the Southern Ocean. You can have a 70-footer. And if the body of water that the 70 footer is floating in gets picked up by a huge sea or swell that then breaks that 70 footer is going to go whack down upside down all the rest of it and if it goes sideways from 10 meters it's like hitting concrete and the side of the hull can sometimes collapse and certainly large sided pilot houses have got real problems that have to be rebuilt to make them strong enough to my satisfaction so we don't allow pilot house boats uh, that's the first one center cockpit's an interesting one because generally, and I accept the fact that Bonabatesi's boat was centre cockpit, but look where he steered from, right? It was basically an outboard rudder with a tiller on it with ropes tied to the tiller on deck that went through to a, a little wheel to pull the ropes to steer the tiller, right? Modern centre cockpit boats have got hydraulics, they've got cables buried away under the double bunk down the back, blah, 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 blah. blah. It's just too hard. And so uh, also the cockpit drains and centre cockpit boats, you know, it's a, it's a bit funny, you know, blah, blah, blah. But anyway, generally speaking, most production centre center cockpit boats are not the sort of boat that I personally would like to be seen in in the Southern Ocean. Um, and so we say generally not centre cockpit boats, right? Uh, and there's plenty of other boats to choose. And I'm not saying that centre cockpit boats are unsafe in ultimate storms or anything like that. I'm just saying generally we wouldn't we wouldn't consider a centre cockpit boat, right? Because steering and getting to the rudder and setting up wind vanes, all that sort of stuff is really important. Um, so generally we say, hey, look, there's a lot of other designs. Can't you think of them? In fact, I even get to the point now where, you know, if I was doing the GGR, I wouldn't go with a wheel. I would have to have a tiller. And there's lots of advantages for a tiller. And so, uh, but I'm not likely to say, oh, you can't have wheels in the GGR, you know, but, but there's some interesting issues there as well. So, uh, so no Halberd Rassi Molly's allowed. Well, Halberd Rassi, nice boats, okay? And I'm not sure. We'd have to see if they meet those requirements generally, but um, that's it. Uh, is there, next one from John, uh, is there a preferred route around north or south or through the Azores? No, there's, they, generally they end up going close because that's where the weather's going, and you'll see that now even with, with Simon, Kirsten, and, and uh, probably Avalis when he turns. Um, that's sort of where, you, where it ends up. But they don't have to go around the Azores. It's not a, a mark of the course. They're just sailing to the weather, but they understand the historic weather, and that's what usually happens. Uh, Vincent, curious to know, Don, do any of the engines have a safety helmet for, for when conditions are bad? It's one thing having a harness, but not very nice if you get a serious bang on the head and the lights go out. Uh, I Certainly some of the engines have got helmets. So I couldn't tell you which ones. I certainly took a helmet in, in 1990, and, and you can see me on, on my video, uh, McIntyre Knockdown on YouTube. Uh, uh, I was wearing the helmet a lot uh, outside, and when there was risk of rollover knockdown, I had seven knockdowns going from Cape Town to uh, uh, Cape Town to uh, Sydney. Robin Davey will tell you that because he was there, and he was just saying, oh, jeepers, how many more knockdowns McIntyre are going to get, you know, because <laughs> we were racing together um, uh, on that one. Uh so, yes, yeah, safety helmet is a, is a good idea, um, and some of them have it. Uh, next one, perhaps a helmet are frowned upon. No, no helmets are frowned upon. Ian was lucky. It was only a couple of cuts. I didn't ask him, but he got, obviously got thrown. I haven't asked him how his injuries was, were uh, sustained. Um, he obviously got thrown in the boat. Maybe he was standing up at the time. I have no idea if he was in his bunk. Uh, he was meant to have uh, straps in the bunk because that's mandatory. You can actually have get in your bunk strap in and it's meant to hold you there and if you're upside down in the boat but i'm not sure what happened to him but yeah a few have got helmets and it's a really great idea uh pierre good morning how do you envisage the look shape of the arrivals at the saab de Lone with the chichester entrant arriving first is there a trophy good committee so um, well there's a set process and it'll be different for simon than the rest of them in terms of that the prize giving is all the same doesn't matter um because the the um uh, the process is, you know, that we will be certainly out there to meet Simon, and I'm sure there'll be plenty of other people out there to meet Simon when he gets in. He's a Chichester entrant. He's not in the GGR race. He's sailing home to the event. It will come to the dock. We'll be there at the dock, and he'll have a bottle of champagne, and da -da 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 -da. I'm sure there'll be uh, heaps of people there. Come on down, you know, come and welcome Simon back to La Sable de Lone. 
um, and uh, it'll be a lot of fun. And I'm sure there'll be a few journalists and staff and family and friends and sponsors and blah, blah, blah. So there'll be a bit of hoo-ha for sure. So that happens. Uh, when the first uh, entrant in the GGR arrives, uh, I'm sure there'll be more people um, because that's the these are the potential winners of the of the GGR, and uh, the interest will be higher, of course. Um, and uh, you know they'll come into the dock, and there'll probably be more people and champagne, this, that, and the other. But then it goes into a different format where uh, we take uh, after 20 minutes on the side, there'll be. Reporters and journalists will be sectioned off, you know, family and friends in there as well, VIPs and then the public around, um, and there'll be a big pack, right? Uh, and then there'll be security that'll take the that person through the crowds, uh, across the bridge, up into a stage, and there's a big stage set up there, and uh, then there'll be VIPs, all the rest of it, and uh, there'll be 20 minutes of questions and blah, 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 blah. And then um, uh, there'll be, once all that's happened, they'll be taken into... Uh, into a quiet room for family and friends to recruit, and, you know, have a chat. Meanwhile, back at the dock, the boat is immediately taken to the uh, fuel dock. Uh, this doesn't happen with Simon because Simon could be using his motor if he wants. I, I'm sure he didn't, but if he wanted to motor through the doldrums, he could have because there's no restrictions. There's, he doesn't get measured up for fuel when he gets to Hobart because, I mean, not Hobart, when he gets to uh, the Saab de Lone because it's not relevant for Chichester. Um, but for the winner of the GGR, the boat goes over to the fuel dock while they're back there doing their bits. We fill up with fuel uh, because they've only got a provisional finishing time once they cross the line. Um, Simon doesn't get a – we're not counting his time across the line because it doesn't matter. Uh, he just sails into La Sable Lane. So then when the fuel correction is done, then there'll be – all the media will go into a, a, a press conference room. Uh, there'll be me. There'll be Yannick. There'll be uh, – uh, uh, the winner and uh, maybe one other out of the table, and when by the then when uh, the winner comes in, if it's if it's Kirsten or Avalish, they'll sit down and one of the first things we will then do is announce the official finishing time in relation to all the time credits for the rescue and also the fuel penalty and credits that are associated. So there'll be an official finishing time, and then we have a press conference and uh, so on, and then it's all done. So you can see it's a bit different for Chichester because they're not racing. They, they don't have to do half that stuff and, and uh, they're not part of the race anymore. So it's not part of the official bits and pieces. At the prize giving, uh, which is a couple of months later, uh, all the GGR entrants are there. So you'll see Damien, you'll see Pat, you'll see everyone else all up there and everyone's celebrated uh, for their participation and their achievements within the GGR. So there is a, there is a, a, a difference. And uh, there's the race, there's the Chichester, and there's those that retired. So, um, okay, uh, Tilt, question. Any chance we could please have more than three minutes of onboard footage and the film drops? Uh, 12 to 15 minutes would be great. Maybe could even leave out the gate and arrive with Well, there's some interesting things going on there. Um, we're, we're now uh, going to be running a lot more. We, we'll finish off all of the um, uh, at see uh, onboard video clips between now and the next couple of weeks. Uh, we've got footage up until Hobart, of course. Then they've got their onboards from there. Uh, three minutes was uh, part of something that we've got where we are releasing certain bits but holding back other bits. And there'll be a big documentary later on and there's a lot of interesting stuff going on. Fathom Films are filming the documentary and uh, you'll get to see a lot. The other thing is once they finish, uh, shortly after they finish, a few weeks later, uh, you'll see a massive amount of footage coming out by all the entrants because they get their footage back and as soon as they're, they're back, they're done. And uh, Captain Good, for instance, has been filming. He's got a whole film crew there. He's going to have a fantastic documentary. There's no question. He's one of the ones that's been doing a big effort to film everything. Um, so I'm looking forward to seeing that. That'll be fun. Uh, Kirsten has got massive interest and she's she's great on camera. So she's been filming her stuff as well. And you've got to understand that she'll be, I'll be very surprised if she doesn't make an award-winning documentary, which everyone will be all over. And so, uh, you know, there's not, you know, you don't want to let it all out there and give it up. You know, it'll be, I'll be keen to watch Kirsten's documentary as well. So there's a few different balancing issues there that we do and we cater for everything, you know. So, uh, and then unfortunately, uh, Jeremy, uh, sorry, um, uh, Jeremy had some issues with his camera and cards and he, he'd lost all his film from buddy, all his oh, sorry, sorry, all his film from Cape Town to Hobart, he dropped it in the water on the marina, gone. Boom! He dropped the cards. He was passing it to a family member or 
relation a relative or something and it and it dropped <laughs> sim card's gone so he's got no footage there and he didn't get much coming down the other way so uh, and all the other engines pat's got some great footage this and the other that'll all be released to him and stuff as well so you're going to see a lot of it come up and they'll uh yeah so stand by uh -oh. now uh where did i get to um okay margaret key subject to discuss uh, has come up in discussion whether races will hold back in order to save their boats for long race. No, they, look, they, they, there's no holding back at all uh, in the sense that it's a long way around the world and they have to pace themselves. So it's not, uh, you know, they don't go, well, so in that sense, you could say, yes, they hold back. If they put everything in all the time, left their full mainsail up and full Genoa in 30, 40 knots, something's going to break, something's going to tear. They have to manage their boats all the way. So, yes, they are holding back, maybe. But you got because you got to finish to win, you know. You 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 got to finish, and it's a balance, you know. When do you hold back? When do we race? Each of the entrants will have a different attitude on that. If you look at Captain Coconut, boy, he held back. <laughs> so he wasn't fast, but he got there. Uh, good crew. You mentioned that Abolish is experienced lack of power on board. I believe I also heard you say that in the last GGR, the organisers have contemplated this issue and considered that if there were to happen with no power, uh, let the contestants uh, continue. Of course, we can. Uh, Robin Knox Johnson, when he sailed all the way around the world, just used kerosene. He had a little charger there to charge the batteries for the for the uh, engine, but that was you know not really successful. So everything was done with virtually no power. Uh, Bernard Battesti went around, had no engine, no nothing, no power generation, kerosene lights. That was it. A sailboat's a sailboat; doesn't need anything. And even our tracking systems are uh, you know battery powered. The YB3, which is the little yellow one over there. Uh, that'll last for six months or more, the full power pack, uh, just doing one ping, uh, a couple of pings a day, so uh, they could sail dark ship. Uh, if they cannot charge the YB3, you lose the track. No, you don't, because they last a long time. Uh, you know, so they would, and we've got two there, so you could, they could sail all the way around the world with those two YB3s starting off fully charged, and we'd get a regular position from them. Um, so that's okay. Uh, and even if we lost it, we have a very simple rule in the GGR, which is explained in depth at the briefings, that uh, no news is not bad news, right? So unless an entrant pressed one of the EPIRBs or whatever, we're not going to go looking for them within reason. We, we assess the whole situation. So therefore, even if we lost track of them on the, the trackers, uh, you know, because we knew their power was going down, we wouldn't insist on saying, oh, code red, we've got to rescue them. We've got to go and find them because we've lost track of them. Not for me. They're happy to sail by themselves and go for it. It's their choice. Uh, they've got all their e – they've got two EPIRBs. They've got two PLBs. If they get in distress, they could do that. Um, it's up to them. So they could sail around dark ship with us not knowing anything about them or where they are, uh, and then all of a sudden they pop up with Sarb Delones. Oh, George has arrived. You know, that's like 1968. It's not unsafe, you know. So uh, – Okay, Mark, what 68 vintage analog wind instrument and other performance instruments have the entrants got? Notice some old instruments on boats. They don't use any instruments. They're not allowed to have uh, uh, electronic log. They can't have wind instruments. They're allowed an electronic echo sounder. That's all. So that's all they have. But some of them didn't pull out the old instruments, like like uh, uh, Elliot. He had his old instruments there and I said, I'll oh, just tape over them, you know, or something like that. But they're not working. Um, okay, Bev. Hi, Don. Do Kirsten or Abolish have any ideas where each other are? Now, do you think? No, I don't think they do. I'm not, I can't confirm that, but I don't think they know where they are. Uh, Richard, respect to Ian, but would the 68 participants have been rescued in the same way as they as Ian was? Uh, you stated many times that this race is like the original one. Absolutely, it's like the original one. And Robin's only out plan for Sue Haley was a little blow-up rubber dinghy with a couple of oars. And so not much choice. They didn't have EPIRBs in those days. Robin had a radio, but it was really iffy, you know, and eventually sort of failed. Um, so you're on your own and you keep going and you don't get the chance to get off your boat. So you've got to get home. And that changes the mentality and the psyche. Um, and so, uh, no, it's a bit different these days. And, and human life is pretty important. And there's a lot of risk mitigation that goes on with this event you know to make sure that all the participants are well prepared and uh, they've got jury rigs and they've got all the safety gear and they've done all the safety training and you do everything you can but accidents happen so um, uh, that's it uh, hey don what happened with puff and ian's boat is it let to sink or did they pull pull in behind the fishing vessel you can't tow a boat like that 
uh, in that sort of big fishing vessel. You know, it's 50 metres, 50 crew, uh, but it would be doing 10, 12, 13 knots, I'd suppose, on average. Uh, you can't pull puffing like that at those speeds. She just knows dive, fill up and go on. You know, you can't have leave someone on the boat. So it's not practical and, and they've got timelines. So uh, uh, Ian didn't get a chance to scuttle it. So it's still afloat and drifting. Uh, hi, Don. When you give your uh, guesstimate of who might win, can you please in future be clear whether you are projecting current, currently who of Kirsten or Ablis will be the first in the SO, who will be the GGR winner? I know we can't know. For sure, on the fuel until the time, Kirsten. Personally, I cannot see how you can currently rate 50 50 as in this morning terms as we'll win because that 23 hours, well, you've got to understand what my prediction is saying. What I'm saying is when I say 50 50, as of today, as of this morning, looking at the weather going forward, uh, there's a 50 50 chance. I can't call it, you know, it's too close <laughs> where they're sitting at the moment. Uh, they both have a realistic chance of being first into Le Sable de Lone. I'm not saying that's going to happen. I'm not saying it's, oh, you know, 400 metres before the finish line, there's 50-50, you know, 50% this, blah, blah, blah. it's just a projection. It's just a discussion. It's not meant to be specific. Uh, and honestly, I describe that as being a 50-50. It's 50-50. Could be Kirsten, could be Abolish, which is great because last week it was vastly different, you know. Uh, Abolish was looking in, in a commanding position. And if he got the weather the way I thought it was going to go, he could be right up there today. It's not the case. Kirsten's uh, sailed well, um, been strategically more more relevant, and uh, it's 50-50. They're both on a par now, which is fantastic. So they're 1,600 miles from the finish, and, and in my opinion, uh, they've both got a realistic chance of getting in first. So that means that is a total sail 50. Oh, here we go. Well, don't go into numbers. You can go to uh, GG Underground to look at the numbers. Um, that means Abley says a sale 12% faster in Kirsten. doesn't matter difference. There's two things here. One is you've got the leaderboard, which is a statistical analysis of what's going on and the average speed the last few days to give you a finishing time. And then you've got real world on the course. And real world on the course is, in my opinion, more important than the leaderboard. Leaderboard.
Then you will oh, okay, so uh, that was all for questions. It all took too long. We lost the internet there, but it keeps running. So now I'm going to sign off. So, uh, yeah, I don't know what happened there. But anyway, uh, we came to the end of the questions anyway. There was just a couple of comments about uh, why can't Americans uh, talk about Antarctica or, ex or di di explain or pronounce Antarctica. So thanks for that.